Professor Carafit here with the pre-lab video for the surface area to volume lab for Bio 1440, uh, 1441 I should say. And uh, surface area to volume is a concept that you really got to understand if you're going to understand physiology um, and uh, why cells are the size they are, why various organs have the shapes they have. So much depends on this concept. So we're going to look at it in this lab in the context of surface area to volume and its relationship to thermoregulation. That is how organisms, especially ectotherms, maintain um, uh, uh, internal body temperature that's conducive to life. So how do they maintain the right body temperatures? How do they cool off? How do they warm up? And how do they take advantage of surface area to volume? Uh, the image here is from a paper um, where they did a study using model organisms. So you can see these model lizards here made of pipe, but they're simulating these different um, stances that lizards say, these different positions. So a lizard who wants to warm itself up on a rock might lay flat on the rock. If the lizard's hot, it might stand up off the rock on its tippy toes, right? It might orient itself towards the sun or, or perpendicular to the sun, depending on what it's trying to accomplish. So these are things to think about. You are going to design your own experiment um, and run it and then write a lab report on your results and you want to make a robust interesting experiment that's tied to reality in some way so that's what your goal is so this slide asks which of these two creatures has the highest surface area to volume ratio so if we think about let's just draw a spherical organism the outer edge is the surface area that's how much edge there is and the volume is the inside how much space is there inside okay so you can think about the skin of the elephant versus how much volume there is in the elephant and you can think of the outer edge of this uh, jellyfish this cnidarian and compared to how much volume it has and the important thing here is the ratio between the two okay so i would guess i don't have a scale bar here to know how big this jellyfish is but i would assume that this elephant has much more skin than this jellyfish. And I would say that the elephant has much more volume than that jellyfish. But that's not the important thing here. The important thing is the relationship between the two. It's how much surface area do each of these have, surface area over how much volume do they have. And that's where the important ideas come into play. Now, in this lab, you're going to, uh, we're going to talk about examples of surface area to volume in biological systems. Um, you're going to research examples of ectothermic thermoregulation. You should maybe want to do that before you come to lab if you can. Design and run an experiment based on or controlling for at least uh, surface area to volume ratios. And you're going to write a lab report over this lab. Now, let me just give you a little more background while I have some white space on this slide. So let's pretend that you know, this circle here is is a city, right? And roads come into the city from the outside. So the more edge there is to the city, the more roads there can be that come in. The volume in the city is where all the buildings are and where all the people live. And and so if we think of this from a like let's just say a cellular perspective, the amount of edge is how much stuff the cell or in this case the city can get in and out at a time how much stuff it can get in how much stuff it can get out it's like the transport system it's the edge of the cell right that's the contact with the outside world it's where all the roads come into the city so a cell the outer membrane is where everything gets in and out it's how much stuff it can get in and out now the volume of the cell or the volume of the city how many people are in the city lets you know how much stuff that cell or that city needs to survive so if you have too much volume and you have tons of people in here, but you don't have enough roads, you don't have enough outer edge to get stuff in and out to feed those people, you have a problem. If you have a cell that gets really big and the volume means the cell requires a lot more oxygen, a lot more food, and a lot more uh, help getting waste out, and the, the amount of edge is not enough to compensate for that, that cell is going to have a problem. So surface area to volume ratios take you know, are important all the way down to the cell level, to why chemical reactions happen the way they do sometimes, all the way up to global issues. 
So you're going to do an initial experiment this week, um, putting hot water into one of two glass bulbs, and you're going to measure and, and see which one loses heat more quickly. And so in order to do that, you're first going to need to calculate the surface area to volume ratios of each of these bulbs. So you might try it ahead of time if you want. Uh, there is the, uh, the diameters of these two bulbs. Um, and the, the equations you will need to calculate a surface area and volume. And you may want to work on that to see if you can do it. Okay. So before you run that experiment with the two different size bulbs, you need a hypothesis. And for this, we're just going to come up with our statistical hypotheses. Okay, so what do I mean by statistical hypotheses? Well, what we're looking for here our, um, our null hypothesis and our alternative hypotheses. So our null hypothesis basically means what we would expect to see if size doesn't matter, if surface area to volume doesn't matter. So in that case, it would be there is no statistical difference in the rate of cooling between uh, the large simulated organism and the small one. H1 will be that small organisms cool more quickly H2, that large animals cool more quickly. So those are our alternative hypotheses, okay? And what you can do is you can collect this data and you can run a t-test to see which of those hypotheses are most supported by the data. After you've done that initial experiment, you're going to try to come up with your own hypothesis, your own, well, your own research question and hypothesis. So you're going to think about what could you, what experiment could you design uh, to test some aspect of what we've been talking about, uh, thermoregulation and surface area to volume ratios. So you're going to have a lot of stuff at your disposal. You'll have heat lamps. There is a uh, incubation chamber in the uh, lab uh, prep room that you can use. You can set it to a certain temperature. You have a fridge and a freezer in the prep room. You have fans. You have uh, bottles with with uh, water in them that you can mist and spray. You'll have clay at your disposal of different colors. You'll have uh, aluminum, uh, not aluminum, but uh, copper pipes of different shapes and sizes that you can experiment with. Lots of different things that you can use to simulate organisms, to simulate various aspects of the real world. Now you'll want to design an experiment that's biologically relevant, meaning you could, you could uh, um, draw conclusions from your data uh, that would help you to understand the real world a little bit better, not just some weird thing that uh, does not apply to the real world. Um, so let's talk about ectotherms and how they gain and lose heat to help you better design that experiment. Okay, so here's a turtle on a rock. Ectotherms acquire heat through absorption from the sun. So heat radiates off the sun, hits the turtle. It's that, that radiation is hitting the turtle. It's being absorbed by the turtle. That turtle is warming up. That's called absorption. That rock below the turtle has also warmed up from the sun, and that turtle is in direct contact with that rock. So that transfer of heat is known as conduction. Okay, conduction. These are all things you could test for, or you might need to control for, depending on your experiment. How does the turtle lose heat? Well, heat radiates off of the turtle and in, out into space. So that turtle is radiating off heat. That's a way that a turtle might lose heat. That's how the Christmas bulbs we just looked at lost heat through radiation. They also evaporate. So, uh, oh, what do, what do I mean by that? Uh, I should say, clarify that. Uh, turtles experience evaporation. So if they were wet when they crawled out of the water, water is evaporating, or their eyes are wet, their nasal passages are probably wet, it, that water might evaporate, carrying off some heat, cooling the turtle down a little bit. Wind or convection typically will cool the organism, unless the wind's really hot, right? Uh, so convection has a cooling effect. And what's interesting is all of these together will reach kind of an equilibrium. Uh, you know, if the turtle is radiating off heat or the turtle, let's put it this way, if the turtle is absorbing heat, let's say, uh, and then the wind is blowing, so, uh, there, there will be a point where uh, the turtle gets to a certain temperature that's kind of out of balance between those two variables. 
So you're going to come up with your own hypotheses. You're going to test some aspect of, of the natural world in terms of how an ectotherm might gain or lose heat or some balance thereof. And you want to design a fairly simple experiment. Um, the best experiment for this lab would be one that has a column graph with two bars on it. Okay, two bars only. Don't try to design something with four or five bars. If you have two bars, you can run a simple t-test to look for significance. You can interpret the data fairly easily, but you should have lots of replications. Okay, so don't just settle for three reps. Try to do a bunch of reps um, and, and design a really good and interesting experiment because you're also gonna want to, want to go to the library, well, at least virtually, and uh, look up papers um, to help support your research project here. So you're going to look for primary sources um, to cite in your lab paper. And so things to think about are, are, you know, things that you could design an experiment on. I'll let your instructor talk about this in greater detail, but position of an organism in relation to the sun, position of the organism in relation to the to the hot rock it might be laying on, or maybe you want to you want to see how well standing up on your toes can prevent convection from ha or conduction from happening. Um, you can design a number of different experiments, but you want to pick one that would create a fairly simple graph with two columns, right? Two columns only. So uh, some kind of control and some kind of variable, uh, and then do lots of replications. So you can look this up online, look up thermal regulation and, and lizards or snakes and try to find examples of ways they cool off, ways they warm up. This also applies to insects, by the way. Now a very important slide, writing a robust research hypothesis. We talked about statistical hypotheses earlier. That's where you have HO, H1, H2, but this is a biological hypothesis. So you pick which one of those hypotheses you think is the most likely to be true, and you kind of write your biological hypothesis around it, or vice versa. So what do I mean? What do we do here? This hypothesis has three parts. The first part is really the hypothesis. And what is a hypothesis? That's an explanation. Many students usually confuse a hypothesis for a prediction, but that's not true. A hypothesis is an explanation. So your hypothesis is the one you think is most likely to happen. What, what would explain that? Why would that happen? Then you talk about your procedure after the word and, and then you predict what the data will do after the word then. So for example, let's say your research hypothesis, I'm sorry, your research question is, what is the effect of fur on the cooling rate of organisms? <clears throat> so your control will be organisms without fur, your, your uh, experimental group are organisms with fur, and you're going to see how quickly they cool down. You put hot water in them, you put a thermometer in them, you see what happens, okay? Now you gotta write that hypothesis, if and then. So the first part is the actual hypothesis. This whole thing we call a research hypo hypothesis, okay? It combines all three of those things. The first part's the real hypothesis part. If fur traps air near the surface of an organism acting as an insulator, that is a really strong, uh, uh, hypothesis. It's a, it's an explanation. Uh, a weak explanation would be if fur acts as an insulator. That doesn't have a lot of explana explanatory power. You want to put why it's going to do that thing. So if fur traps air near the surface of an organism acting as an insulator and temperature loss in organisms with and without fur is measured, so that's and you put what your procedure is, then those organisms that do not have fur will cool off at a faster rate than those that do, period. So you say, if I do this, I'm sorry, if, the, if this is correct and I do this, then this will happen. That is the research hypothesis. The hardest part for most students is that first part after if, because that is an explanation. You have to use your biological knowledge to write a robust explanation for why you think the data will happen. A few guidelines this week. Don't mix different colors of clay together. Why? Because lots of students need to use that clay. And if you mash red and purple clay together, you get some weird new smushed up clay that you can't take back apart again. 
Don't throw out fabric if you use fabric because that can be reused by other students. Don't, it says don't leave bulbs wrapped in clay. How about this? Do not wrap Christmas bulbs in clay. That's gross, there's no point in it. Don't do it. So don't wrap bulbs in clay. Um, if you wrap a bulb in fabric for some reason, take it off when you're done for the day. Take everything apart, leave the lab nice and neat because there's lots of students that need to do this lab. And if you leave it all messed up, it'll be very difficult for them. Clean the lab really well. Uh, you'll be using vernier units to measure temperature. Um, they can stay on between labs. Um, at the end of the day, if you're the last lab of the day, you could shut them off. All right, so I think that sums it up for this pre-lab video. I hope you find it somewhat helpful and uh, good luck designing your experiment. What I would do, uh, I'll put up another video soon on how to find primary sources because you'll need to find journal articles to write your paper. So what I would do if I were you is just start doing a Google search looking for examples, real life examples of thermal biology, regulation, surface area to volume, all those kinds of ideas. See if you can find any cool examples to model for your experiment. That'll make uh, your experimental design much easier. All right, good luck.